Bonjour à tous ou bonsoir selon que vous êtes parmi nous en Europe ou quelque part dans le, dans le Pacifique. Mon nom est Françoise Nicolas, je suis directrice du Centre Asie de, de l'IFRI, pour ceux qui ne me connaîtraient pas. Bienvenue à cette conférence de lancement du programme Océanie, mise en place par l'IFRI en partenariat avec la Communauté du Pacifique dite CPS, une très ancienne organisation, la plus ancienne dans la, dans la zone, puisqu'il s'agit d'une honorable vieille dame de 75 ans. Elle fait cette année même ses 75 ans d'existence. Le siège de la communauté du Pacifique est, pour certains qui ne le sauraient pas, à Nouméa, et c'est la première fois qu'elle organise une conférence en, en Europe. Nous sommes évidemment très fiers d'organiser cet événement avec la communauté et aussi très reconnaissant à la communauté d'avoir choisi l'IFRI comme, comme partenaire. Alors, la conférence se déroulera alternativement en français et en anglais, selon la, la langue que les intervenants choisiront, et vous pouvez bénéficier d'un service d'interprétation simultané en français et anglais, et pour ce faire, vous pouvez accéder au service en cliquant sur le petit globe qui est situé en bas de votre écran. Et vous pouvez choisir soit le canal français, soit le canal anglais. Donc voilà pour les petites précisions logistiques. Maintenant, pourquoi ce, pourquoi ce programme Pourquoi cette, cette conférence Évidemment, elle peut paraître un petit peu décalée au vu des derniers événements qui se déroulent en ce moment, en ce moment même en Ukraine et qui retiennent notre attention bien loin du, du Pacifique. Et évidemment, la décision d'organiser cette, cette conférence est bien antérieure à la crise ukrainienne, mais elle ne perd en réalité en aucune manière sa, sa pertinence. En réalité, dans un monde globalisé, d'abord, aucune région n'est à l'abri des soubresauts qui interviennent même à l'autre bout de la, de la planète. Et dans le, dans le cas d'espèce, l'invasion de l'Ukraine, les bouleversements qui s'en suivront immanquablement, et que l'on peut d'ailleurs déjà observer, tous ces bouleversements n'épargneront pas non plus cette région du monde, qui est le Pacifique, ne serait-ce qu'à travers l'impact qu'ils auront sur les grands équilibres mondiaux, sur les pays européens aussi, et sur les calculs stratégiques des uns et des autres. Et puis, si l'actualité en Ukraine retire notre, retient notre attention, il ne faut pas oublier non plus que la lutte pour préserver nos valeurs démocratiques et un ordre international fondé sur le droit se joue aussi dans le Pacifique. En conséquence, même dans ce contexte très troublé, l'intérêt que les pays européens manifestent dans, depuis plusieurs années pour la vaste zone indo-pacifique ne devrait pas se, euh, se démentir. La France et l'Union européenne, vous le savez, ont publié ces dernières années leurs stratégies respectives pour ou sur l'indo-pacifique. Et d'ailleurs, un grand forum sur l'indo-pacifique, réunissant plus de 60 chefs des diplomaties des pays européens et des partenaires de la région, s'est tenu le 22 février dernier à Paris, sous présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne. Et le niveau de représentation à ce, à ce sommet, en dépit déjà des tensions qui apparaissaient à nos portes, atteste du sérieux de l'implication des pays concernés. Il s'agit pour la, la France et l'Union européenne de vraiment se réinvestir dans la zone indo-pacifique, une zone stratégique devenue aujourd'hui le centre de gravité économique et politique du monde, mais dont la stabilité est menacée par des risques transnationaux, le changement climatique, des épidémies, la pression sur les ressources naturelles, mais aussi des tensions interétatiques exacerbées par la rivalité sino-américaine. Or, ce que l'on constate, c'est que dans ces discussions sur l'Indo-Pacifique, la zone qui couvre les États et territoires membres de la communauté du Pacifique fait en réalité l'objet d'une moindre attention et elle constitue ce que j'appellerais quasiment un angle mort de la relation Indo-Pacifique. Et pourtant, ces euh, États et territoires du Pacifique, même s'ils ne représentent, ils ne réunissent plutôt que 13 millions d'habitants, il représente une zone économique exclusive maritime de plus de 30 millions de kilomètres carrés, 
soit près de 15% de la surface du globe, et une zone qui est stratégiquement située au cœur même du Pacifique et aux richesses multiples. Évidemment, euh, qui dit richesse dit convoitise. Ces territoires sont une réserve exceptionnelle de biodiversité, mais ils excitent également toutes les convoitises. Cette zone-là, donc l'Océanie, est aux avant-postes de défis que l'on peut aller jusqu'à qualifier d'existentiels, le changement climatique, la protection de la biodiversité en particulier, mais elle constitue aussi un champ au sein duquel jouent à plein les grandes rivalités géostratégiques. Malheureusement, la distance géographique et la connaissance toujours limitée de cette région en Europe ne favorise pas toujours l'intérêt politique, économique et médiatique. Et c'est bien dommage, et c'est ce que nous allons essayer précisément de compenser. C'est pour cela donc que l'IFRI et la Communauté du Pacifique ont décidé de mettre en commun leurs compétences et leurs savoirs pour organiser un cycle d'activités sur l'importance stratégique de la zone pacifique. Ce, cet, cet ensemble d'activités s'organisera autour d'une conférence de lancement, donc à savoir aujourd'hui, puis des séminaires de, de recherche qui seront accompagnés d'une série de petites publications courtes et également de vidéos. Ce que nous allons essayer de faire, c'est de donner surtout la parole à des acteurs locaux, aux côtés d'experts et de responsables publics, et ce programme va s'attacher à susciter l'intérêt en Europe, à accroître la visibilité du Pacifique insulaire et à nourrir le débat sur les problématiques clés dans cette région. Pour ce faire, nous sommes extrêmement heureux aujourd'hui d'avoir avec nous M. Stéphane Bijou, qui est député européen et au Parlement coprésident du groupe d'amitié Union européenne, pays et territoires d'outre-mer. Je vais lui passer la parole sans plus attendre pour quelques remarques introductives. Donc, Monsieur Bijou, nous sommes heureux de vous avoir avec nous et je vous passe la parole pour votre, vos mots d'introduction. J'espère que vous êtes bien là. Je suis là, merci et, et je vous dis euh, bonjour et je vous dis euh, aussi bonsoir parce que euh, ici à Strasbourg, le soleil euh, vient de se lever, mais je sais qu'à Nouméa, le soleil vient de se coucher et ce décalage dans, dans le temps témoigne de notre euh, distance dans l'espace, mais dans les paroles et euh, dans les actes, eh bien je sais que euh, nous sommes proches. Alors, je suis heureux de vous retrouver euh, aujourd'hui pour le lancement de cette série de travaux sur le Pacifique portée par euh, l'IFRI en collaboration avec la Commission du Pacifique Sud et je veux tout de suite euh, placer la barre des enjeux à un niveau euh, élevé. Une guerre effrayante est aux portes de l'Union européenne. Tout le monde a bien compris que nous sommes à un tournant euh, historique et chacun s'inquiète légitimement. Personne ne sait où et jusqu'où ira euh, la brutalité unilatérale de Vladimir Poutine. Et j'assume de dire ici que, en même temps que nous devons euh, tout faire pour euh, sauver la paix en Europe, en même temps, nous devons aussi porter notre regard, notre vigilance et notre engagement jusqu'à euh, l'océan Pacifique. Pourquoi Eh bien, euh, parce que, comme l'Europe, le Pacifique est aussi au cœur des enjeux géostratégiques de ce 21e siècle en effervescence. Les relations internationales sont complexes, notre monde est devenu dangereux et les prises de conscience se construisent sur une réalité qui n'a pas toujours été une évidence. Aujourd'hui et demain, où que nous soyons sur cette planète, nos destins sont liés. Alors, dans ce nouveau contexte qui redéfinit aussi la hiérarchie des priorités, l'axe Indo-Pacifique est un impératif et une solution. C'est un impératif géostratégique de défense et de sécurité. La guerre en Ukraine montre la nécessité d'avoir une vision globale de la défense européenne, une vision mondiale qui dépasse les seules frontières continentales européennes pour intégrer aussi les autres zones de conflit, notamment en mer de Chine. La réalité des rapports de force, c'est que l'Indo-Pacifique est le principal théâtre de la rivalité entre la Chine et les États-Unis. Et de toute évidence, l'Europe doit aussi s'affirmer, affirmer sa propre voix et défendre ses intérêts. Et puis, face aux pirates et aux trafics, 
il y a bien sûr la nécessité de garantir la sécurité maritime de l'Union européenne, qui a d'ailleurs annoncé en février le déploiement d'une présence maritime coordonnée dans le nord-ouest de l'océan Indien, cette fois, cet axe indo-pacifique, je veux le dire, est aussi une solution économique, une solution pour contrecarrer les nouvelles routes de la soie, qui sont des routes chinoises à sens unique, mais euh, nous sommes aussi une solution en termes d'opportunités pour les territoires du Pacifique qui pourront euh, valoriser leur potentiel et euh, leurs ressources. Je veux dire que l'agenda euh, politique européen n'a jamais été aussi euh, favorable. L'UE euh, vient de lancer sa stratégie euh, globale Gateway pour euh, justement contrer cette offensive euh, chinoise. La stratégie européenne permettra d'accélérer le déploiement d'infrastructures dans la région pour riposter, innover et protéger. Il y a une dynamique réelle. En septembre 2021, l'Union européenne a présenté sa première stratégie pour la coopération dans la région Indo-Pacifique. Et vous l'avez dit, sous l'impulsion de la présidence française du Conseil, un forum Indo-Pacifique, le premier du genre, a été organisé le 22 février dernier à Paris. Objectivement, il y a là l'affirmation d'une nouvelle volonté de l'Europe d'être un acteur de premier plan dans la région et la volonté de travailler avec l'ensemble des territoires. Et comme l'a rappelé le haut représentant Joseph Borrell, le centre du monde se déplace vers l'Indo-Pacifique. Alors les défis que nous devons relever sont immenses, en plus des positions géostratégiques de défense, en plus des impératifs de sécurité. Il y a aussi l'enjeu de la protection des ressources, des ressources halieutiques ou énergétiques. On ne peut plus accepter que des navires pirates chinois viennent piller nos ressources en toute impunité. L'Europe doit être notre partenaire dans la préservation de nos stocks de poissons et de notre biodiversité. Alors, quand on regarde la liste des grands défis globaux d'aujourd'hui et de demain, on voit bien que les régions de l'axe Indo-Pacifique, et notamment les îles, les atolls et les États insulaires, sont directement en première ligne d'une autre menace terrible, c'est la menace du dérèglement climatique, comme vous. Euh, J'ai encore en tête l'image frappante de l'intervention du ministre des Affaires étrangères de Tuvalu, les pieds dans l'eau, appelant au secours la COP26 de Glasgow. Nous devons entendre cet appel et nous devons y apporter plus que des mots. Il faut impérativement euh, agir. Au Parlement européen, euh, je plaide en permanence pour faire reconnaître nos territoires insulaires comme des territoires de solutions sur lesquelles l'Europe doit miser. Et quand je parle de solutions à créer, je parle aussi des grands défis transversaux, comme la connectivité, la prévention contre les menaces sanitaires ou la sécurité alimentaire. Alors, sur l'axe Indo-Pacifique, nous devons investir pour nous adapter et nous devons sécuriser pour mieux protéger. Des actions existent déjà, je pense notamment à l'initiative Kiwa dans la région pacifique, soutenue par la France et par l'Europe. Nous devons les renforcer et les partager avec d'autres territoires. Et quand je dis partager, je redis que je crois à l'intelligence collective de la coopération régionale. C'est un chemin de convergence, d'engagement et de sécurité. Et sur l'axe indo-pacifique, il y a deux régions ultra-périphériques et quatre pays et territoires d'outre-mer. La volonté d'agir de l'Europe reconnaît le rôle de ces territoires, mais il faut désormais transformer ces paroles en actes. Les outre-mer doivent devenir des postes avancés de l'Europe dans l'Indo-Pacifique, autant pour la promotion des valeurs européennes que pour impulser des coopérations nécessaires pour trouver des solutions aux défis communs. Pour conclure et pour lancer les échanges et croiser nos regards, je veux affirmer ici que la construction de l'axe Indo-Pacifique ne doit pas et ne pourra pas se construire sans les Outre-mer chacun sur son territoire et tous ensemble collectivement, nous sommes le cœur rayonnant et du rayonnement français et européen dans cette grande région stratégique. C'est à Nouméa que siège la CPS et le bureau de la Commission européenne pour les PTOM dans le Pacifique. À Lansvata, c'est la France, l'Union européenne et la grande région pacifique qui travaille ensemble sur le champ des possibles. Vous êtes à un carrefour stratégique et nous sommes tous ensemble dans cette grande pirogue qui doit affronter les vagues des grands défis de ce siècle. Nos anciens nous ont transmis le Pacific Way, 
un seul océan, un seul peuple. Alors face aux grands défis, et notamment face aux grands défis de la paix qui vient chercher chacun de nous au plus profond de nos cœurs, eh bien, nous devons travailler ensemble, nous devons nous faire confiance, nous devons construire une grande force collective pour que, de ne pas péter à la Réunion en passant par Bruxelles, nous soyons bien ensemble pour mettre en commun ce que nous avons de meilleur. Voilà euh, ce qui m'anime profondément et que je voulais partager avec vous aujourd'hui. Je vous remercie et maintenant avec euh, humilité et euh, respect. Je me mets à votre écoute. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Bijou, pour ce vibrant appel et pour avoir souligné l'importance de la, de la région pacifique pour nous, Européens, et pour l'ensemble du monde et de la stabilité du, du monde. Nous avons maintenant le privilège de partager avec vous un message spécial enregistré par le président des États fédérés de Micronésie, M. David de Panuelo, et message qui témoigne également l'intérêt de la région pour ce dialogue avec l'Europe. The Federated States of Micronesia, or FSM. Today, the Pacific Community, SPC, and the French Institute of International Relations are hosting panels to talk about two important questions. What is going on in the Pacific Island countries? And what interests and roles of Europeans in the Pacific? My introductory remarks today will attempt to answer these two questions from the perspective of my country. What is going on in the Pacific Island? Well, let's look at the context of the In our country and in no particular order, we are constantly talking about or thinking about the existential security threat of climate change. When open our borders and transition safely from our status as COVID-19 to status of COVID-19, how do we improve our economy to bring back our existing abroad? How to make our infrastructure climate clear? How to manage the needs of our people while equally managing our relationships, our friends, partners, and ally. I will speak on each of these before proceeding to the second question. Climate change is a reality for the FSM and all Pacific Island countries. Existence and forthcoming gravity impact the whole of our society and every single domestic and foreign policy decision we make. In remote islands like Kapinamarangi, which is home to a unique ethnic and We face hard questions like how do we survive if our taro patches become inundated with salt water? How do we keep the land culture alive people live when they get older? From Tuvalu to the Marshall Islands and from Fiji to Samoa, every island is facing questions of how to mitigate and adapt to climate change. COVID-19 is another topic our collective Pacific region is focused on. The FSM, we are still COVID-19 free. We have more than enough vaccines for our population, every person to get fully vaccinated and boosted. But closing our borders the way we have since January 2020 has meant substantial economic hardship to our people. At some point, I will need to make the decision to reopen our borders if only so families can be reconnected and businesses can prosper. But I closed the borders to save life, which is the responsibility of any public servant with the capacity to do so. It is essential that we consider the value of human life in all of our decisions and recognize that lives matter and dollars. But our economy matters too. And there's no escaping the fact that Pacific Islanders, regardless of jurisdiction, don't wish to be home, but often feel that they are required 
do in order to seek a better life in Samoa and Tonga, we see temporary workers in Australia and New Zealand working in the agricultural sector. For the FSM or the Federated States of Micronesia, it means that about one third of our total population lives in the United States of America, including some of our best. If you have a PhD and you work in the school system in the state of Chu, and you experience to still make less than someone moving to Guam tomorrow to make working in the hospitality sector. Immigration is a right to our compact of free association with our first and foremost ally, the United States. And I would never begrudge any person for seeking a better life abroad. But the result is brain drain. It hurts our capacity to tackle problems like climate change and our nation's overall development. Tackling climate change, as I mentioned above, is our primary task. For this purpose, we have been trying to make our infrastructure climate resilient. Worth explaining what I mean by that, because I'd forgive you if you heard the term climate resilient roads and thought it was a fancy marketing tool. But it's not, it's a real thing. In Bombay State, our capital, where it rains nearly every day of the year, the roads that we fix can become full of puddles in a matter of months. Roads that decay directly leads to pollution in our waterways, which kills off the mangroves that keeps us safe from big ocean waves. Much of my administration has been focused on expanding climate resilient infrastructure, such as roads that can last decades instead of months and years, and buildings that won't collapse when a typhoon hits our shores. That's why managing our relationships our partners, friends, and allies is so critical. The broader Pacific foreign policy is that we are enemies to not be friends to all. And this is embedded in our FSM Constitution, which declares that we extend to all nations that which we see. Peace, friendship, cooperation, and love in our humanity. But what does that mean to manage our relationships? Well, with development partners at the NGO level, such as the community, or as we see, it means asking for your support in enhancing transparency and accountability in our government. For the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, it means soliciting their support for our climate resilient infrastructure projects and for the region or sub-region wide organizations like the Pacific Islands Forum and the Micronesian President Summit. It means liaising with our Pacific Island brothers and sisters so that we can jointly work together to make our voice impactful abroad, whether it's at the COP26 or at the United Nations General Assembly. There's another level to all of this. And it relates to this meeting's intention to discuss Europe's views on the Indo-Pacific strategy. The FSM, or the Federated States of Micronesia, is the only country in the world with a compact of free association with the United States of America and diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. We call our relationship with America an enduring partnership. We call our relationship. China, they create the Americans to the FSM are like family, and the Chinese to us in the FSM are great friends. A critic might, or a critic with a dim view, might assume that Pacific Island countries wish to maximize the fruits of our relationships with all countries. And to the FSM, or the United States of Micronesia, they say that we can education sector funding from America, control boats from Australia, food upgrades from Japan, and government complexes from China. 
And it's true that we are getting those benefits from our partner, but it's not simply because we want to take all that we can. It's because at an elemental level, we want peace. I cannot drive to Peligar from my home in my municipality without passing by the relics of World War II. And the relics I see in my country are similar to what you would see in Kiribati, Solomon Islands, and other countries in our region. That's in part why the FSM or Federated States of Micronesia severed diplomatic relations with the Russian Federation when they invaded Ukraine. It's our country's way of emphasizing that we cannot even begin to tolerate not even as an idea that another war in the Pacific can be possible. Our region must be peaceful today and tomorrow and forever. This leads to the second question the conference will ask. What interest and role is there for Europeans in the Pacific? The very short answer to that question is a lot. There is a lot that Europeans can do in the Pacific. And let me count the ways, starting with why Europeans should be interested in the Pacific. And concluding that I envision the Europeans' role in the Pacific could be. Regarding why Europeans should be interested in the Pacific, the first answer is that it's because Europeans have never left it in the first place. Australia and New Zealand are predominantly English and ethnically European. New Zealand, in particular, has sometimes been described as the most European country outside of Europe, as Australia, has sometimes been described as the most American country outside of North America. Like the United States with Guam and Hawaii, France territories in the Pacific. Here in the FSM or the Federated States of Micronesia, and I say this with much love, but also with quotation marks. We were discovered by the Spanish, which is why there is a Spanish wall in Colonia. Then the Germans came to make money out of selling cobra, which is processed coconut. And that is why there is a German pelt power and church relics in Colonia. The second reason Europeans should have an interest in the Pacific is for the same reason. Europeans should have an interest in the activities and development in the Caribbean, the Americas, Africa, or Asia. That is, we are one of the places in the world. And what happens here doesn't happen here inevitably influences what happens or doesn't happen in your own shores. In the FSM or the Federated States of Micronesia, we take democracy very seriously. And so we were emboldened by the Ukrainian president's leadership when he stood by his people and stood by his values during the unambiguously villainous Russian invasion. Likewise, here in the Pacific, a year ago, we saw a crisis in democracy unfold in Samoa, where an unelected prime minister sought to retain power against the will of people. FSM was the first country in the world to recognize Yama Naomi Matahafa as the prime minister of Samoa because we believe in democracy and democratic process. But imagine if democracy failed, how would that impact the crisis of democracy in your country? It might not have the same impact as if Donald Trump won the second term as the US president, but it would have some impact. And it is in your best interest as Europeans to simply know what is happening in our part of the world so that you and learn from us, whether it's in the form of practices you want to emulate, such as our concept-based decision-making process, or 
questions you wish to better understand, like how a country that is in foreign partners with the United States can have such a great friendship with China. This leads me to a potential role for Europeans in the Pacific. For the same reason that the best mothers and fathers are present in their children's lives, that the best teachers are present in their students' lives that the best priests are present in their flocks and church, and that the best friends are present with you through the end game. It is in Europe's interest that European presence in the Pacific be enhanced and renewed. I am not speaking of a form of neocolonialism or an all for exploitation, but I am very much calling for the expansion of diplomatic missions and let me give you some examples. For about 70 years, the United States has conducted the longest running humanitarian operation in the world, Operation Christmas Truck. Through this program, the United States Air Force air truck packages onto our remote island. The effect is that our remote communities get access to presents like essential supplies, toys for the children, and fishing gear. And the United States Air Force gets to enjoy a highly rewarding trading experience. In recent years, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand have joined the United States Operation Christmas Trump. Would this program be even better for the French, the Italians, the Polish, or the Lithuanians in the Czech Republic? I cannot speak on the United States, yeah? But I bet you that if you ask them if Europe can help, that they enthusiastically say yes. I'll give you another example. Pacific Partnership. This US-led coalition program sees the United States, Japan, Thailand, Malaysia, Australia, and other countries working together provide tangible support to the country. Salt for the FSM has meant activities like fixing rooms on schools, providing medical training to our nurses, and providing care to remote communities, among other things. These kinds of programs sound interesting, and if you simply see the value in having European eyes in our part of the world, and I have a final recommendation for I can establish an office of in the North Pacific. I believe that such an office located in the North Pacific will allow the office currently located in PG in the South Pacific to be better focused in its effort there and also allow for Europe to enjoy expanded coverage in the Federated States of Micronesia the Republic of Palau, the Republic of Nauru, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of the Kibas. You would be welcome, dear, and you will find that you are not alone as we have recently seen the opening of a new United Nations multi country office in our sub region of Micronesia. I do know, in the interest of transparency, that on January 21st of this year, I wrote to His Excellency Emmanuel Macron in his capacity as President of the Council of the European Union to advocate that it is in the Pacific's interest as well as the Europe's interest that the European Union expand its office to the North Pacific to be based in the Federated States of Micronesia. I hope my remarks today have left you with the same feeling that what happens in the Pacific Island Island matters that Europeans absolutely have a role and place in this space. And that this is one way of making that happen. Thank you for giving me your time. Have a wonderful and productive conference. Alangan, and thank you all very much. Merci, Monsieur le Président.
pour cette déclaration et je vois que tout le monde est en, en réalité sur la même ligne et sur l'affirmation de l'importance de cette région du Pacifique pour l'Europe, en particulier pour, pour la France. Alors, je vais maintenant passer en, à l'anglais. Je suis désolé pour ce petit, <rire> ce petit changement. La raison est que le premier, la première, le premier panel euh, va faire participer des intervenants qui vont s'exprimer, pour la plupart d'entre eux, en anglais. Et donc, euh, let me switch to English. So this first panel is about a very broad topic. The point is uh, to discuss what's going on in the Pacific, in the Pacific Islands. So uh, what we are expecting is to provide uh, various perspectives on this issue and pers perspectives coming from uh, officials, from external observers like uh, think tankers, So a variety of perspectives on the situation in the Pacific, so as to highlight the, the importance of this region, but also the challenges that the region is facing. The challenges, the opportunities as well, and uh, well, the factors of stability in the region, factors of instability in the region. So it is really, the, the point is really to set the scene in a very broad, broad way. So uh, for this, we have, I think, an uh, excellent uh, lineup of speakers. And I'll just give you the, the names uh, of the speakers by alphabetical order. Don't uh, over interpret the, the order. So the first uh, speaker will be Cameron Diver, who is Deputy Director General for the Pacific Community. Uh, second uh, in line is Cleo Pascal, who is non-resident senior fellow for the Indo-Pacific at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, DC. Third in line is Christelle Pratt, Assistant Secretary General, Head of Department, Environment and Climate Action at the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States. And last but not least, Zara Khan, Director of the Program and Initiatives of the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. So uh, I will give you the, the floor each, uh, each, in, uh, each in turn. So let me remind you of the rules of the game. First round, with about five, seven minutes per speaker. And each speaker will address the, the issue, this very broad issue, what's going on in the Pacific Islands from his or her own perspective as an observer, an official, etc., a, a person, an expert in climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for first round with seven uh, minutes approximately, then each of you will be allowed to react to the other uh, presentations. So there will be some kind of a, a interaction or interactive discussion among the, the, the speakers. And then uh, we will also open the floor to the audience. So in, in this case, the audience can uh, raise their questions by using the uh, Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the screen. I guess everybody is now used to using this after two years of COVID and uh, lockdown and video conferences. I think everybody knows that. Uh, so uh, I think that's about all I had to say. But before we engage in the discussion, we want to show you a short video, which was produced by uh, EPOP, a project supported by the French uh, IRD, Institut uh, Pour la recherche et le développement. And this video, uh, has, uh, this uh, institute has a partnership with the uh, SPC, so with the uh, Pacific community. And this video is really a testimony of a fisherman in Fiji. And I think it is a very precious testimony, very precious, and it helps to humanize the discussions, to show on the ground, so to speak, what are the problems faced by the people in the uh, Indo-Pacific Islands and uh, the impacts that all these changes will have on geopolitics, climate, and so on. There are people living on these islands and they should be the priority of our discussions. So if we could watch the video, here it is, I think. Yes, here it is. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Eddie. I'm a child of God. I'm from Kandawu Afta, and I've been selling fish for 20 years. Nice. The fisheries department was saying that they want to ban the fish cow cow for three months this year. But uh, the way I look at it, part of my business, it's uh, just like spoiling the business. Customers also, because um, fish in the sea, cow cow, it's like no man on earth can catch all the fish that is in the sea. Money. <laughs> What we should do is try and stop the pollution that is going into the sea. All the rivers, there's a lot of rubbish there, and people are throwing not enough plastic and uh, diapers. No, ah. they're throwing it into the sea but because there's some small creatures that will, will feed on it. You know? Oh. If you cannot stop the pollution, everything in the sea will die. You have to clap your hand to make a sound. So we have to work together so that everything in the sea will be good. So back to the, the real world. So we are now uh, ready to uh, start our first panel. So if you should, if you could uh, switch on your videos, I'm talking to the uh, speakers. That that would be great. And uh, so, are you all there? Yes, I can see Zarek. I don't see the others, but they may be coming on screen here. Yeah, here they are. Yeah, I see you all. So that's perfect. So, uh, so I, I was just uh, saying before, this is really a first session to set the scene and to try to identify really what is going on in the Pacific Islands. Uh, I think that um, the order in which I will give you the floor, I guess I'll start out with uh, Cameron and then perhaps uh, Zarek. I will start with the two male speakers. And then uh, last but not least, we will sw switch to the female speakers with, I guess, Cleo as, as the last person. She, she is really the external observer talking about geopolitics, so the broader topic. So I guess it's kind of logic that you will be the last to, to, to speak. All right, so Cameron, the floor is yours for about seven minutes for introductory remarks. Uh, we're all ears. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Françoise. Bonsoir à, à tous depuis Nouméa, en Nouvelle-Calédonie, au cœur de, de l'Océanie et de cette région dont nous parlons en particulier ce soir. Um, Permettez-moi tout d'abord de remercier uh, l'IFRI, uh, l'Institut français des relations internationales, pour ce nouveau partenariat que nous, nous avons noué ensemble. C'est important de, de le saluer et de saluer l'engagement des équipes de l'IFRI pour l'organisation de cet événement et également le, le cycle de recherche qui euh, s'en suivra. Donc, merci beaucoup, très sincèrement. Pour ce qui concerne ce qui est en train de se passer dans la région Pacifique, moi, je vais vous parler plutôt du côté de quelqu'un qui travaille dans une organisation intergouvernementale focalisée sur le développement durable. Dans ce cadre, les besoins sont multiples. Les défis sont multiples et recouvrent toute la gamme des objectifs de développement durable adoptés par les Nations Unies. Et donc, en sept minutes, je ne prétends pas du tout être exhaustif en la matière, mais je vais mettre en lumière un certain nombre de, de défis, de, de sujets, de réflexions. Tout d'abord, bien évidemment, euh, comme euh, d'autres euh, l'ont fait avant moi, il faut parler du changement climatique lorsqu'on parle de l'Océanie. Euh, les îles, les pays du Pacifique, les populations océaniennes sont sur la ligne de front du changement climatique. Euh, ils ont besoin euh, d'un accès euh, facilité au financement climatique pour travailler à la fois sur les mesures d'atténuation, mais également et de manière très importante sur les mesures d'adaptation, tel est le niveau de vulnérabilité des îles et des populations aux impacts déjà en cours du changement climatique. Dans ce cadre-là, bien évidemment, l'un des grands enjeux, c'est la transition énergétique, comment arriver à net zéro 
dans une zone où souvent, en fait, on est tributaire de transports internationaux qui dépendent d'énergie fossile, que ce soit le transport maritime ou le transport aérien. Lié à cela, il y a aussi la transition écologique plus largement. Comment intégrer dans les, les politiques des solutions basées sur la nature Comment reformuler ce, ce nouveau deal entre la nature et l'humanité euh, appelé euh, par, euh, par plusieurs dirigeants, à la fois de la région et au niveau euh, global. Euh, il y a, je l'ai dit, un besoin euh, d'adaptation et d'atténuation dans la région, mais je veux insister sur le fait que l'adaptation au changement climatique dans le Pacifique insulaire ne sera durable au sens du développement durable et réellement pérenne que s'il y a des efforts absolument massifs d'atténuation partout ailleurs dans le monde. Le Pacifique peut arriver à net zéro demain, ça comptera pour du beurre si les grands pays pollueurs ne fassent pas les efforts nécessaires pour réduire de manière nette leurs émissions de gaz à effet de serre. C'est l'une des grandes clés de l'avenir de la région et l'une des grandes clés de l'avenir de la planète. Je pense aussi qu'il faut qu'on qu parle de la biodiversité. La région pacifique est riche en biodiversité, héberge trois des 36 hotspots mondiaux de la biodiversité est un, un véritable laboratoire de solutions basées sur la nature. Il y a dans ce cadre-là énormément de synergies avec le Green Deal euh, européen euh, et, et là encore un, un intérêt réel euh, à la fois pour coopérer pour le bien du Pacifique, mais aussi pour trouver des solutions qui peuvent être adaptées euh, à d'autres géographies, euh, à d'autres défis, à d'autres populations. Et quand on parle du Pacifique, on ne peut pas euh, éviter de parler de, de l'océan. À la fois l'océan comme puits carbone euh, qui euh, capte 13% des émissions de gaz à effet de serre par an, mais aussi l'océan euh, qui nourrit non seulement les pays de la zone, mais aussi le reste de la planète. Euh, la pêcherie au thon du Pacifique central et occidental est la pêcherie la plus riche au monde. C'est 34% de la prise au thon annuelle mondiale. C'est plus de 5 milliards de dollars de bénéfices. Et c'est la pêche qui fait que lorsque vous mangez du thon euh, à Bruxelles, euh, à New York, à Buenos Aires, il y a des chances pour que ce soit du thon qui vient euh, de la région Pacifique. Donc là encore, euh, le Pacifique peut paraître lointain, mais ça peut aussi être très, très proche. Ça peut être directement dans votre assiette sans que vous le sachiez et contribuer justement à votre sécurité euh, alimentaire. En termes de, de santé, bien évidemment, euh, on est dans une région qui est impactée par la pandémie de COVID-19. La relance euh, économique post-COVID va être quelque chose de particulièrement euh, important. Il va falloir essayer de conjuguer euh, une ouverture qui préserve le côté sanitaire pour, euh, pour des petits états insulaires dont les systèmes de santé publique ne sont peut-être pas outillés comme euh, un certain nombre d'états euh, développés. Euh, donc, on pourrait craindre, par exemple, une saturation euh, des hôpitaux avec une ouverture précoce de frontières. Il va falloir euh, aider ces économies à se remettre de leur fermeture euh, lorsque, pour beaucoup, euh, on compte sur le tourisme pour une part importante de son PIB. Euh, et euh, il va falloir également ne pas oublier les autres maladies, comme les maladies non transmissibles, le diabète, euh, par exemple, ou les maladies cardiaques, qui sont, euh, elles, pour le coup, responsables d'à peu près 80 des décès dans la région. Donc, on a une pandémie mondiale de COVID-19, mais on a véritablement une épidémie de maladies non transmissibles dans la région qu'il faut traiter pour le bien-être, encore une fois, des populations. Il y a l'enjeu de la connectivité. J'en ai parlé, la connectivité aérienne et maritime, mais aussi la connectivité numérique. Comment utiliser le numérique demain pour combler la tyrannie de la distance c'est un grand enjeu euh, sur lequel on peut travailler avec des partenaires européens comme d'autres euh, et qui permettrait justement de relier encore plus euh, le Pacifique euh, au reste du monde. Euh, on a célébré il y a, il y a deux jours euh, la journée internationale de la femme. Euh, je dois absolument parler de la violence faite aux femmes comme un défi, mais c'est un défi dans la région Pacifique, mais c'est un défi global. Euh, dans notre région, malheureusement, euh, on a des statistiques qui montrent que 63% des femmes en, dans la sous-région mélanésienne, 44% en, dans la sous-région micronésienne et 43% euh, dans la sous-région polynésienne 
ont expérimenté ont été victimes de violences physiques ou sexuelles par leurs conjoints. C'est un taux qui est absolument gigantesque. La moyenne globale, c'est 35 Et ça, c'est une maladie de société. Ça mine les fondements du développement durable. Ça mine les fondements d'une société réellement inclusive. Euh, inclusive et ça mine l'espoir en fait, de voir naître des communautés où euh, chacune et chacun peut s'épanouir et participer à la vie de la cité. Mais là encore, ce n'est pas qu'une question de pays développés ou non développés. On le voit, le, le taux de féminicide en France, en Australie, ailleurs, c'est élevé. Euh, ces violences-là touchent toutes les couches de la société, riches, pauvres, toutes les ethnies, toutes les communautés. Donc là encore, des enjeux que l'on vit dans le Pacifique se jouent également sur le territoire européen comme ailleurs. On a les mêmes défis, on a les mêmes aspirations pour le développement. Donc, il fait sens de coopérer avec le Pacifique. Il fait sens pour moi d'apporter un soutien aux pays et populations de l'Océanie parce que c'est aussi une manière de, de les aider euh, à avancer vers leurs objectifs de développement, mais de faire rayonner les valeurs de l'Europe et celles du multilatéralisme. Et sur ce point-là, euh, j'aimerais juste rappeler que cette question de valeur n'est pas anodine. Euh, lors du vote de la résolution sur l'Ukraine à l'Assemblée générale de l'ONU le 2 mars dernier, qui a été portée largement par la diplomatie européenne euh, et celle des États membres, aux côtés bien évidemment d'autres soutiens, seule l'Océanie de toutes les régions a voté en faveur de manière unanime. En Asie, aux Amériques, en Afrique, au Moyen-Orient, des pays manquaient à l'appel, soit en votant contre, soit en s'abstenant. Ce n'était pas le cas des pays du Pacifique. Donc là encore, l'Europe a pu compter sur le Pacifique. Et encore et enfin, euh, le Pacifique recèle des matières premières stratégiques, dont le nickel. Et dans le contexte actuel de sanctions contre la Russie, il ne faut pas oublier que la Russie est ou était le premier pays exportateur de nickel, mais que le troisième pays exportateur est la Nouvelle-Calédonie siège de mon organisation, la communauté du Pacifique, collectivité française de l'Océanie, PTOM de l'Union européenne et archipel situé au cœur de l'Océanie. Donc c'est une raison de plus pour maintenir et approfondir l'intérêt européen et la coopération européenne pour une région lointaine lorsqu'on la voit de l'hémisphère nord, mais ô combien important pour une série d'enjeux globaux et la recherche de solutions aux défis qui font fi de la géographie et nous impactent tous. Nous vivons dans, une, dans un monde globalisé à la confluence des interdépendances. Certes, le Pacifique a besoin de l'Europe, mais moi, je suis convaincu que l'Europe a aussi besoin du Pacifique. Merci. Many thanks, Cameron, for a very clear um, presentation. We're stressing the commonality of the values and the commonality of our interests and our objectives. Uh, so now I'll give the floor to, to Zarek. Uh, I'm sorry, I have uh, slightly adjusted the order of, uh, of the speakers, but I, I thought it was one more logical. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That's uh, the privilege uh, of the chair. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're at your discussion, so more than, more than happy to oblige. But uh, thank you very much, Francois. May I take this opportunity to thank uh, IFRI, uh, SPC, and also acknowledge my fellow colleagues from the Pacific, uh, Christelle and Cameron. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, this evening. Uh, warm Pacific greetings from uh, Suva, Fiji, where it's about uh, 8.30 p.m. Uh, in the evening. Uh, I think my colleague uh, Cameron has appropriately captured a lot of the strategic issues, particularly in relation to climate change and, uh, and also some of the opportunities around uh, fisheries and, and, uh, and other resources. I will try and uh, capture and uh, provide more information about some of the drivers uh, and inhibitors uh, for growth in the Pacific region, as well as try and provide some of the private sector perspectives uh, in terms of the issues uh, we deal with. Uh, I'm very happy to represent uh, our Secretary General uh, from the Pacific Islands Forum, who unfortunately could not uh, be here this evening. Um, so the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, uh, as you know, or the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, is a member-driven organization uh, representing 18 uh, member states of the Pacific region. Uh, as part of the work that we do, uh, we support the development of the private sector here in the Pacific region. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that uh, is through our Pacific uh, Trade and Invest uh, Network, uh, which is our investment and uh, trade promotion agencies uh, across uh, our key markets in Australia, in New Zealand, in China, in Japan, 
And we also have a very important office in Europe, uh, located in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, uh, which supports uh, trade uh, between the Pacific and the European market. Uh, apart from that, uh, the Pacific Islands Forum also supports uh, our members in terms of developing private sector policies, uh, which will help them address a lot of the challenges uh, to private sector development uh, in their respective countries. Uh, this includes uh, basic things that uh, you may in Europe take for granted, for example, starting a business, uh, getting electricity permits, uh, getting permits for ut other utilities, uh, internet, uh, property rights, for example, um, bankruptcy. And so a lot of these uh, are basic challenges and fundamental challenges uh, which are faced by our members uh, and they require a lot of support, uh, not just from the forum, uh, but also from our colleague regional agencies such as SPC and also the multilateral development partners, the World Bank, IMF and other UN agencies who work uh, in this particular space. And so in order to address a lot of these fundamental challenges uh, and for a region like ours, partnerships uh, are very critical. Partnerships with the uh, European agencies is, is very important. And certainly the support that we receive uh, from the European Union uh, through uh, the European Development Fund and Development Cooperation Resources is very critical to us. Uh, for example, uh, we receive funding for about 37 million euros uh, from the European Union uh, to support uh, trade development in the Pacific region. And uh, there are a number of implementing partners, including SBC, uh, the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, the Asian Development Bank, uh, and, and the UN agencies, UNCTAD, which work towards delivering these essential services uh, to our members. Uh, there's many opportunities for us, and I would like to start off on a positive note in terms of focusing on the opportunities. And one of the biggest ones is through the Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, which is a trade agreement uh, between the European Union and the Pacific region. Now, many of you uh, may ask, why does the richest and the biggest uh, trading bloc in the world, which is the European Union, with a consumer base of 500 million, want a trade agreement uh, with the Pacific, uh, which is one of the smallest regions in the world, with one of the smallest populations? Uh, but the answer for that is very simple, in the sense that we don't look upon this trade agreement as a conventional or traditional trade agreement. Uh, development is at the heart of this arrangement, meaning that we get a lot of resources from the European Union, to develop the competitiveness and the capacity of a private sector in the region so that they can trade not just with Europe, but also other regions in the world. And a good example was what Cameron highlighted a bit earlier on fisheries. So Europe is the biggest seafood market in the world, more than 15 billion euros per annum. Uh, and the Pacific is the largest supplier of tuna in the world with 60% of the world's tuna resources. So it makes sense uh, for us to develop uh, capacity in the region, have more processing plants, have more value addition, more diversification, so that more of the returns from our resource, which is tuna and fisheries, remains in the region, rather than being leaked across to Asia and other places which are processing a lot of our tuna at the moment. And so a lot of the tuna from the Pacific goes to Thailand, for example, which is the largest uh, tuna producer in the world, and then is then re-exported in the European Union. But we have made some gains and some positive developments in, uh, over the last uh, many years. For example, the largest tuna processing plant in Solomon Islands, is owned by an Italian investor. So we are seeing more European investments coming into the Pacific, and we'd like to see more such examples uh, coming into place uh, in the future. And uh, having more European investors, not investing just in, in the fishery sector, but there's also other potential opportunities in tourism, uh, and also in terms of ICT. There's a, the Pacific is now more well known as a business process outsourcing center in the region. We've got one of the largest uh, call centers, for example, here in Fiji, which employs uh, close to 2,000 people. And they answer calls and they make airline bookings for Brussels Airlines, for example, uh, Swiss Airlines. So taking advantage of the time zone differences. And also, uh, it allows for more people in the Pacific to move across and, and work in different countries. So, for example, in Fiji, we have a lot of uh, Ni Vanuatuans who speak French or are Francophone. And they're able to work in Fiji and answer calls in French. And so some of these are some of the examples in terms of the gains uh, that we have made. Uh, there's also opportunities in terms of kava. Uh, kava is a major export in the Pacific region. Uh, we see it as a health supplement uh, and an antidepressant in terms of extracting the kava lectones from kava. And so this, this is a very successful product in Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. And we're hoping we can export more of it uh, to the European Union. Apart from kava, we have also good cocoa and good coffee, uh, which the Pacific region is, is well known for. And these are just some of the opportunities for trade, which are not tapped as much as they should be. And we're hoping that 
uh, through the forum and our partners in Europe, we can strengthen the business to business partnerships and the networks to take advantage of them. Now, in terms of challenges uh, very quickly, I think Cameron covered it very well. Uh, COVID has had a very big impact uh, on businesses in the Pacific region, uh, particularly on tourism. Uh, tourism is, is uh, you know, the mainstay of a lot of economies in the, in the Pacific. Uh, the lack of travel opportunities, the closure of borders uh, has resulted in a lot of uh, people losing their jobs, unfortunately. A lot of women in particular who, who are employed in the tourism uh, sector being affected. Uh, the positive is that now we seem to be end, at the end of the pandemic or towards the end of, tail end of the pandemic. The borders are slowly opening up and we're seeing a lot more visitors from the United States, from Australia, from New Zealand coming in. We're hoping in the future that more Europeans will also consider the Pacific as a good tourism uh, destination. Apart from that, uh, climate change obviously has had a major impact on businesses in the region. Many of you may have uh, seen the big uh, uh, volcanic eruption in Tonga and the tsunami in Tonga. Uh, that is just an example, of not just climate change, but of disasters in general uh, that have an impact on, on, on businesses which have to close down, which unfortunately have to let go of workers. And so what the forum has done is we've developed something called the Pacific Resilience Facility uh, that has been uh, approved and endorsed by our leaders in 2019. Uh, the Pacific Resilience Facility is intended to uh, give small scale grants to communities across the Pacific region to prepare against uh, disasters, uh, whether it's climate induced or other natural disasters and ensure that they're able to develop the capacity. And these are uh, women, these are young girls, these are communities at the village level, at the rural level, who normally are neglected uh, by some of the bigger facilities and the bigger funds uh, that are available internationally. So we're hoping that uh, Europe, uh, European Union countries, uh, will be able to support the Pacific Resilience Facility. We're having a pledging event uh, in New York uh, later this year that will be convened uh, by the UN Secretary General and uh, we're hoping that our partners can come on board. We're looking at mobilizing about 1.5 billion US dollars uh, to support uh, our member states in the Pacific. And we're, we're hoping that this can be a successful initiative that everyone can gather around. So I'll probably leave it at there, Francois. And then, uh, you know, once the question and answer session comes in, I'm happy to respond uh, to any questions from the audience as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Zarek, uh, for uh, complimenting what had been said by uh, Cameron to a large extent. So now I give the floor to Christelle same uh, treatment, about seven minutes for your uh, introductory remarks. And thank you very much, uh, Francois. And um, I'd like first to just uh, thank the organizers uh, of this event, uh, IFBI and uh, the SPC, uh, for the invitation to participate um, and for starting a dialogue that seeks to shine a spotlight on the Blue Pacific continent. I do hope the event will heighten uh, understanding, uh, visibility, recognition, acknowledgement and awareness of why it is important uh, and why um, the Blue Pacific continent is an important part of the Blue Planet and why the Blue Pacific should not be overlooked uh, nor underestimated. It is a vast uh, oceanic uh, continent, 40 million square kilometres in area and home to 40 million people. So this equates to about 11% uh, of the world's ocean and 8% of the Earth's surface. And it describes the uh, Pacific Islands Forum, which has 18 members, with two uh, being territories of France, uh, New Caledonia and French Polynesia. And we have just heard uh, this from uh, Director Zarak Khan. I'd like to focus on three things. Uh, strategies, partnerships, and traditional arrangements. Regards uh, strategy in the Pacific's perception of the various uh, Indo-Pacific strategies. I believe that the Pacific Islands Forum Secretary General, uh, His Excellency Henry Kuna, uh, in his remarks at the recent Ministerial Forum for Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific Strategy, uh, that meeting held in Paris on uh, the 22nd of February, is both telling and fitting. He shared with the meeting uh, the work now underway in the Pacific to develop the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific uh, continent, uh, a strategy that is based on discussions and decisions of Pacific Islands forum leaders. Of the 2050 strategy, uh, which is founded on a shared uh, commitment to protect people, place and prospects, of the Blue Pacific and which will be endorsed uh, this year. Secretary uh, General Kuna says, and I quote, it is intentional. 
it is future facing, and it is all about us. Forum leaders see the strategy um, as, a vital, as vital to addressing the challenges facing the planet, uh, such as the climate, biodiversity, health, and that you know, being COVID-19, and as Cameron mentioned, NCDs, and uh, the financial crises. Uh, while at the same time, um, apologies, I'm trying to stick to points, I stay within the time function. Um, while at the same time, uh, planning and owning their development agenda uh, in order to build resilience and sustainability. And so to realize this, this will require partnerships. And so to my second point of who may be the main key partners of the Blue Pacific continent. In this regard, the Pacific has um, always been interested and open to inclusive and enduring partnerships. Partnerships that recognize and support the collective strength and well-being of the Blue Pacific. Partnerships that align with the vision and priorities of the 2050 um, strategy for the Blue Pacific. Uh, and as eloquently reinforced by President of the FSM, uh, His Excellency Penuelo, uh, just now, uh, he shared in his address, we are friends to all uh, and enemies to none. The Pacific Islands Forum now has 21 dialogue partners, uh, of which France is a founding uh, dialogue partner uh, when it was established in 1989 uh, and with the European joining in 1991. So that partnership arrangement has been long-standing. And so this brings me to my third and final point uh, on traditional arrangements. And the question asked about the expectation of the EU's role in the region, by the region. Uh, so perhaps the best guidance is the Blue Pacific Principles to guide uh, Pacific Islands Forum dialogue and engagement. Um, including with dialogue partners, so including France uh, and the European Union. And this was endorsed uh, in 2019 in Tuvalu at the Forum Island Leaders 50th meeting. There are five principles, and I just want to touch on these. One, Blue Pacific, recognizing and engaging with the full forum membership. The second principle, embedding and progressing the forum's regional priorities. Uh, and we've heard about this uh, from Cameron. Third, um, embracing a partnership approach through joint planning, programming, and delivery by both the Pacific Islands Forum and the Forum Dialogue Partners. The fourth principle is about utilizing existing mechanisms by aligning with and seeking to build off existing uh, and regional and international mechanisms, processes, and meetings. And I think we should remember this. And finally, the fifth principle of collective outcomes and impact. And this through developing joint outcome statements and outlining a clear process for follow-up and implementation. Um, the Pacific is an important part of the organization that I currently work for, the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, uh, or the OACPS is its term. It is the second largest uh, intergovernmental organization after the United Nations. It's made up of 79 member states and six regions of the global south. Um, the OACPS has had a 45 year long and a 45 year strong uh, partnership with the European Union. Uh, and there is a new agreement that will be signed this year. That agreement has a foundation agreement and then it has three regional protocols. Uh, for the Pacific regional protocol, I would offer that the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific and the Blue Pacific principles for dialogue and engagement will be important instruments to guide effective implementation, excuse me, not just of the agreement, but of the protocol, and also the companion neighborhood development and international cooperation initiative, the uh, Global Europe and DT as it is termed. And so, uh, Francois, I, I, I stop here and thank uh, you all for your attention. Uh, merci beaucoup. And just a special hello to my dear friends and brothers, Cameron and Zara. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christelle. Uh, and now, last but not least, Cleo, uh, please, for the really the observer's point of view, so so to speak. So what's your take on the on the region, the importance of the region, what's going on in the region? What are the challenges? Um, uh, merci énormément, Françoise, and uh, merci to the Pacific Community and IFRI, two great organizations for hosting 
this important event. Um, I've been asked to speak about politics and geopolitics from an outsider's perspective, and uh, everything I'm going to say is pretty widely known by the people of the Pacific, and in fact was generously taught to me by Pacific Islanders. Uh, so it's more directed towards the Europeans uh, and those from outside the region, like myself, who are trying to understand it a bit better. So first, politics. So there are uh, vast cultural and linguistic differences uh, in the region, even more so than within the EU. Uh, however, in most places in the region, the cultures are old, deep, complex, and tight-knit. So imagine living in a place, because usually they, they have very vast maritime exclusive economic zones, but in many of the countries, it's small islands, and the families have lived there forever. So um, imagine living in a place where at any time you can run into anyone you've ever dated, anyone your spouse has dated, every teacher you ever had, anyone you lent money to, anyone you borrowed something from, any ex-employee, any ex-boss, anyone you worked with, anyone from your congregation, and any one of a thousand cousins. Right? It, it has an effect on the way a society functions. The result is complex societies. These are very complex with a lot of flexibility within strict social norms. A lot is forgiven up to a very clear point if you understand the society. Any transgression can be remembered for generations. People will say, oh, you know, they're from a good family because their great grandfather did X or they're from a bad, whatever. Um, they, people carry that with them. So most of those societies have also developed a way of speaking that's rife with ambiguity. They're, they often give themselves a verbal out uh, if you're, so that if you're getting too close to a line, you can, you can back away. So, just because somebody says no to you doesn't mean they agree with you. Um, people who've worked in Japan uh, may find this familiar. It's, it's, in some ways, it's familiar to Japanese culture. Also, in much of the region, uh, modern roles are overlaid over traditional responsibilities. So someone might be a groundskeeper to pay the bills, but their traditional identity is this, a speaker for a high chief, which has a, quite a high status. Everyone local will know the traditional, more important identity, even if it only involves infrequent public duties. This means, this is very important if you want to engage with the region, that to understand what's going on, non-locals need to go to church, drink kava, go fishing, go to funerals. A flying consultant with Asia experience is unlikely to produce something usable. And we've seen a lot of that happen over the, over the decades. As for geopolitics, uh, as old culture, the re cultures, the region also has very long memory of shifting geopolitics from internal conflicts between the islands to colonial period to World War I, World War II, to the Cold War, and to now. The rest of the world may have temporarily forgotten the strategic importance of the Pacific Islands, but the leaders of the region never did. Current leaders meeting visiting delegations are likely to be relatives, if not direct descendants, of the leaders who negotiated with the British, American, French, Spanish, German, etc. delegations who've been coming to the region for 140 years. The intelligence and sophistication of regional leadership should not be underestimated. As you heard from the excellent opening presentation by uh, His Excellency David Penuelo, the uh, President of the Federated States of Micronesia. Micronesia, over the last 130 years, has had parts of it ruled sequentially by Spain, which lost them to Germany after its defeat in the Spanish-American War, which lost them to Japan after its defeat in World War I, which lost them to the US after its defeat in World War II, and is now finally independent. And as the president outlined, is carefully balancing very complex sets of competing interests while taking bold stands, such as severing ties with Russia. I think it's the only country that is overtly severed, severed ties with Russia. It's a very courageous move. Uh, because it knows firsthand the cost of their people of strategic failure and the importance of independence, staying independent, like Ukraine is trying to. Geopolitically, the current driver in the region is Beijing's assessment of the strategic importance of the Pacific Islands to China. It's, we can't shy away from the fact that this increasing interest, a large part, is being uh, driven in reaction to what we're seeing coming out of China. For the past two decades, there's been an exponential effort on the part of Beijing to gain influence in the Pacific Islands. Coordination is facilitated by China's large embassies across the region with staffers who speak the local language. They go to CAV, they go to church, they have seemingly limitless slush funds. Uh, there are over half a dozen think tanks in China dedicated to understanding the region. And what, they, what China did was very interesting, knowing that Beijing is kind of diplomatically congested. Uh, a part, a large part of the engagement with the Pacific Islands out, was outsourced to Guangdong. So uh, the think, a lot of the Pacific Island think tanks are in Guangdong and a lot of the uh, diplomatic visits from Pacific Islanders or the scholarships or whatever go in through Guangdong so they don't get lost in that Beijing fog. 
also the government of Guangdong then um, has a vested interest in maintaining and improving that relationship to increase their value to Beijing. So it's a good policy and it's something that the EU might like to think about uh, um, in going forward, sort of delegating certain aspects to certain countries that are best fit to do it so that it doesn't get lost in the, in the miasma. Those efforts have paid off for Beijing in a range of ways, including relaxed visa requirements for Chinese entry, uh, BRI membership, countries slipping diplomatic recognition from Taiwan to China as happened with the Salomon Islands and Kiribati in 2019, and Chinese police cooperation, Fiji, Samoa, Cook Islands, Vanuatu. Uh, Cleo, Cleo, if I may, yeah. could you slow down your, the pace? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, the interpreter... Right. Yeah, the interpreters are, are, are I'm sorry. Str str struggling, and so and, and you're getting more and more enthusiastic as you talk. <laughs> <laughs> so you speak more and more quickly. So, merci yeah, François. Yeah, slow down a bit. Okay, allez un petit peu plus là. Puis, in fact, what I'm going to talk about now is geography. So, uh, Céline, si c'est possible, can we uh, can we put up the map because this will help explain. Uh, why Beijing thinks Oceania is so important. So um, China is developing a world-class military. The tip of that spear, of that military spear is the PLA Navy. So Beijing wants to be capable of challenging and eventually displacing America as the preeminent naval power. Between 2016 and 2020, the Chinese Navy added the equivalent of Japan's entire current surface fleet and it's on track to have nearly twice as many surface ships as the US Navy by the end of the decade. The problem for China is that to use its Navy, it needs access out of its ports and into the Pacific. But if you're looking out from the East coast of China, there are a series of island chains that can be used to block that access. So the first island chain, so imagine you're standing on that Chinese coast and you're looking out, that first island chain roughly stretches from Japan, including Okinawa, through Taiwan and the Philippines. And that's known as the first island chain. There are only a few points where you can get a deep a submarine uh, covertly out from China through that first island chain. The second island chain includes Guam, Marianas, Federated States of Micronesia, and more. So these chains are a problem for Chinese strategists. It's one of the reasons why China is so serious about uh, trying to take Taiwan. They need it to escape the first island chain. At the same time, Beijing is also trying to um, gain influence in the second and third island chains to disrupt American planning and potentially get support for its efforts in the first island chain from behind. People in the region know this and talk about it openly. Chinese strategic expansion was mentioned in the State Department just last month as the reason the US will be opening an embassy in the Solomon Islands. And in fact, today, the front page story in the Solomon Star newspaper is headlined, gun shipment alert about a consignment of weapons that has just arrived reportedly from China. The region is also being name checked more frequently in quad documents and in the recent US Indo-Pacific strategy. UK opened uh, high commissions in Oceania. I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Nguyen's will be talking about that. Japan, which is already well represented, is opening new missions in Kiribati and New Caledonia. And there, there's more, including this session. For the sake of time, because I'm getting to the end here, uh, I'd like to focus on how this is playing out in one specific part of the region, Micronesia, which includes Guam, Marianas, Nauru, Kiribati, and three US freely associated states. The Marshall Islands, Federated State of Micronesia, um, which is the country of President uh, Penuela, and Palau. The last three, as President Penuelo mentioned, have unique compacts of free association with the US, which uh, give the US right of strategic denial of other countries. So in this map, you can see Micronesia sort of clustered together um, in, the, in kind of the top left. Kiribati actually, which is part of Micronesia, also extends into what this map calls Polynesia. Um, so if, if you're looking at a strategic front line between China and the, and the Americas, uh, that the first thing that you hit coming out of China is Micronesia. So uh, the reasons that this is such an important area strategically, and this is a geopolitics session, 
is um, most of the countries have these close ties with the US. Indeed, Guam is US territory with US citizens. Uh, the three freely associated states in particular are very different from, for example, the countries of Polynesia. The, the schools are different, the sports are different. Uh, the links to the US are very strong. Their citizens serve disproportionately in the US military. Uh, Palau recently requested the US to set up a military base in the country. And you can contrast that with the diplomatic language of much of Polynesia, which is rightly or wrongly far less welcoming of hard power. Three of the countries in Micronesia also recognize Taiwan. Um, there have been recent issues with the Pacific Island Forum in which the, the five independent countries of Micronesia said they were leaving the forum. That departure is now paused, reportedly under pressure from the US State Department, pressure which is not being well received in all quarters in Micronesia. The financial component of the COFA is up for renewal as well. And in spite of a series of bipartisan letters from Congress to the administration, those negotiations are far from being resolved, which is also adding tension to the relationship with the US. So for all these reasons, I would strongly echo President Panuela's call for more diplomatic missions, including from the EU and EU countries across the region, and the setting up of an office of the European Union in the North Pacific, so that the EU can get to know the countries and people of the region directly, and they can get to know the EU. As someone in Tonga once told me, if you aren't here, we think you don't care. I'd go even further and suggest that while not, include, not ignoring the South Pacific or the excellent organizations such as the Pacific Community, which does great practical work, that the EU also support the work of the Micronesian Presidential Summit, which is the organization made up of these five Micronesian countries. For example, perhaps a Micronesian Security Council could be supported so the region can share security concerns and solutions with each other and have a direct unmediated contact point for outside partners like the EU. This is a highly complex and dynamic region as the French or an integral part of the region know very well. Direct communication with the people of the Pacific Islands is essential for sustaining the free and open Pacific we all hope for, as mentioned by Deputy Stéphane Djou. And for their help in that, I'd like to thank IFRI and the Pacific community for hosting this important meeting and the translators for putting up with me. Merci. Well, thank you, Cleo. I think you slowed down and I, it, you made the interpreter's lives much, uh, much easier towards the end of your talk. <laughs> so that should be okay. Uh, all right. Well, thanks to all, all of you for your uh, presentations. Uh, for, first thing I would like to ask you is, are, are there any reactions, in particular, I guess, to uh, Cleo's talk on the part of the other speakers? The reason why, why I'm asking this is that well, Cleo had, doesn't have exactly the same perspective as you do uh, as an external observer, plus as somebody talking about geopolitics and addressing issues that may not be necessarily you know, the, well, first of all, the thing that you, you talk about all day, uh, and they also may not be things that are entirely politically correct, so to, so to speak. I mean, they, she touched very sensitive issues, I, I suppose. And so what I would like to, uh, to know is uh, if you have any reactions to, to this uh, approach. I mean, do you see things the same way? Do you, uh, do you perceive the roles of other partners in the various talks you uh, and all of you, all three of you, uh, emphasized uh, very heavily the potential role of the EU, and you called for more active uh, action coming from the EU in this part of the world. But I would, what I would like to know before that, before you, we engage in that, and I guess the second session would be much more focused on uh, on this kind of, uh, of of issues. How do you see the the role of other partners? There are a number of partners, and I would even go as far as say that this region is a very crowded region. Uh, as I, as uh, I said in my introductory remarks, and uh, it was also repeated by a, a number of you, this region is a rich region for a number of reasons, and so it's a very attractive region. And so as a result, we have a number of uh, countries which are extremely interested in the region and which are quite active in the region. So kind of forgetting the EU for some time, how do you see the uh, in interactions with other partners, the interventions by other partners, the uh, you know, policies followed by other partners in this part of the, of the world? 
So who wants to go first on this very broad question, both reactions to Clio and you know, going towards your assessment of the roles of other partners in the, in the region? Who wants to go first? Christelle? I'll try to go first, um, simply because I'm going to have to leave this really interesting uh, meeting. I have a, a, another uh, commitment, so I apologize. But um, I, 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 you know, to, to, the, to the question, um, and thank you, Claire, for your perspectives um, uh, on geopolitics and, and the Pacific. And I, I, I would agree with you um, in your opening um, remarks about the Pacific and its diversity, and some of the long cultural ways in which we engage. Um, and so I think, as you say, um, if uh, you have to really um, uh, understand the silences um, and to be able to read silence. And I, uh, it's something that I always used to say to European colleagues that would come to work uh, in an organization that I worked in many uh, decades ago. Uh, that the first thing that they must learn is the Pacific language of silence. Um, and so when somebody says yes, it doesn't necessarily mean the case. But I was particularly taken by the eloquent uh, present and really impassioned presentation by uh, President uh, Penuelo uh, uh, in the opening uh, of this meeting. Um, and, you know, and I used um, a, a, a little, just a couple of words that he said um, from the outset, and that we are friends to all, uh, enemies to none. Um, and I do feel that, um, you know, he was also quite direct uh, in outlining and underlining the Federated States of Micronesia's um, partnerships and relationships. Um, and he, you know, unashamedly um, describe those at, to this meeting. Uh, in, in my um, brief uh, remarks, I did talk about the 21 forum dialogue partners, um, and they, of course, include France um, and the European Union, but they include um, others, uh, the United States, uh, China, um, France, uh, sorry, not France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan. Uh, you know, the Republic of Korea and so on. So I won't read through the whole list. Um, but I do feel uh, again that um, the partnerships and the approach by the Pacific uh, is about being uh, open and inclusive uh, and encouraging, uh, you know, of, uh, of partnerships, um, of partnerships with all. And so, um, while I appreciate some of the, um, you know, the analysis by, by Claire, uh, I would also offer that the, um, the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific, um, I would uh, encourage when that particular strategy is endorsed, I would encourage uh, all of our partners um, to look to that uh, and to see um, the way in which we, um, on the Blue Pacific continent, uh, wish to you know wish to engage with others so that it is about the blue planet in the end and as Tanuelo said um, you know what happens on our shores happens will, will, will happen on yours at some stage um, so uh, it's not really to uh, counter what Claire has said but just again to remind us as to why um, we uh, our leaders uh, are developing a 2050 strategy for the blue Pacific continent uh, and why they have um, and embraced, you know, the Blue Pacific principles for dialogue and engagement. And I don't think that we should uh, ignore those instruments um, when, you know, when one engages with us. So that's a, just a, a, a slight response, but I enjoyed your presentation very much, uh, Claire. Um, thank you. Um, and I will just say goodbye and to thank all of you um, very much for inviting me again. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christelle, and sorry to see you go <laughs> so early, but thank you, thank you anyway. So who would like to, to go now? Cameron, Zarek, who would like to react both to Cleo and perhaps co comment on this uh, geopolitic perspective, role of other partners? Uh, Cameron, I see you nodding. 
or Zarek. Um, Zarek wants to go first, apparently. Yeah. If it's okay with the, with Cameron, uh, I, I can jump in quickly. I'm noting uh, Christelle mentioned the 2050 strategy uh, for the Blue Pacific Continent, uh, which is uh, perhaps our, our keystone uh, project or initiative here at the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, noting that we are uh, in the midst or towards the tail end of finalizing the 2050 strategy and hoping to table it uh, for our leaders' endorsement and consideration at the next uh, Pacific Islands Forum meeting uh, that Fiji will be hosting uh, later this year. As, as Christelle was, was mentioning, uh, I think it's, it's not to counter what uh, Cleo had uh, mentioned, but I think what Cleo has done is, is, uh, is something value, very valuable in the sense that this is actually the, the lens uh, which external stakeholders from outside of the Pacific region are looking at the Pacific with. Uh, they look at it from an Indo-Pacific lens, but for us uh, in the Pacific, we consider ourselves uh, the Blue Pacific region, a region of large ocean states. And I think for a long time, uh, the Pacific has been taken for granted in terms of uh, its role in, in, in the global arena. But now, as you're seeing, because of geopolitics and for better or for worse, uh, the Pacific is now front and center of, of importance in terms of the global conversation. And uh, this is something that we welcome, uh, particularly because of the fact that our members, our member states have aspirations when it comes to developing uh, their resources, uh, developing opportunities for the people, whether it's for, on trade, uh, whether it's on fisheries and other areas that uh, we had mentioned a bit earlier, uh, obviously we don't have the capacity to do it ourselves. And this is why partnerships is, is so critical for us. As, Chris, as Christelle has mentioned, we have 21 forum uh, dialogue partners, uh, which meet with our leaders uh, on an annual basis uh, to discuss how they can help us, uh, you know, where the needs are in the Pacific region and how they can uh, fill in those gaps and, and develop those capacities which are urgently needed. Uh, and I think you know there was a heavy emphasis on China, obviously in, in Cleo's uh, presentation. You know, China, China re remains a very important partner uh, to the Pacific region. Uh, we look at it from a development partner relationship in terms of uh, the assistance and the support uh, that China provides, especially when it comes to the aftermath of disasters, uh, when it comes to obviously supporting the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's not just China. Obviously, the European Union has been an equally uh, major a contributor and a supporter of the Pacific region, including Australia, including New Zealand, uh, the United States. Um, so we are very grateful, we're very appreciative uh, for the support uh, that has been lent to us uh, by everyone. I think what we are looking towards is exactly what uh, His Excellency uh, President uh, Panuela had uh, illustrated in his opening address, in the sense that we are uh, friends to all and enemies to none. Uh, we don't uh, discriminate uh, between our partners. Uh, we look at it uh, from a point of view of where they can come in and help us, where can they come in and support us? And perhaps uh, I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, perhaps Cameron may, may wish to add to that. Thank you. Well, thanks to Zarek. Well, Cam Cameron, your own take on this? Thank you, Francoise. Uh, I think what's key uh, here is uh, coordination of the multiple partnerships. Um, and the means by which those partnerships are coordinated. And the suggestion, for example, to use the uh, 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific uh, as a, a hub, if you like, uh, for the way in which external partners engage uh, with the region and countries um, is an excellent suggestion to ensure that there's a mutualized platform with a series of understood values that underpin it uh, and objectives that go along with it. And that can then be scaled up or scaled down to individual countries or sub-regions, um, depending on the, the interests of the particular partner. The, the difficulty, obviously, is, is getting everybody to, to play nicely, uh, is ensuring that values of peace, democracy, and good governance are not only espoused in the conference room, but also espoused uh, when we're actually implementing uh, cooperation uh, with Pacific Island countries. Uh, and uh, that there is something that continues to, to, to be worked on. Um, and it, again, it depends on your perception. As has already been said, the Pacific is enemy to none, uh, friend to all. And the needs are such that it is critical to have these multiple partnerships because one partner alone or one group of partners alone uh, cannot uh, respond to the, the magnitude uh, of, of the need. This is where Pacific regionalism really truly has a role to play uh, at a global stage as the paradigm through which uh, that engagement takes place. And I would just also like to, to mention that, uh, excuse me, that there's also uh, a growing synergy between um, 
areas that didn't necessarily see themselves as complementary in, in the past, but today do. Um, and that is uh, security and defense forces and development. The discussions that I've had, for example, with the uh, members of the Pacific Quad go to show that uh, you know, th there's no peace and security without sustainable development, and there's no sustainable development without peace and security. And today, um, those synergies need to be integrated within the development paradigm and within the defense paradigm um, so that we have a really holistic approach to this. And that too can be impacted by the things that Cleo has spoken about um, in what I thought was an excellent geopolitical presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cameron. But uh, I would like you to, to elaborate a bit on the uh, or the concrete way of precisely achieving these synergies that you're talking about. I think it's a, a very interesting point to, to stress the possible synergies between the security and defense and development uh, objectives. Can, can you, could you uh, yeah, elaborate a bit on how you see that happening in concrete terms, if possible? <laughs> uh, well, look, I, I only have one point of view. And once again, um, it's certainly not gospel. Uh, but... Uh, I think that there's a there's a need uh, to bring development organizations in on the ground when, for example, in response to a humanitarian, a humanitarian crisis, uh, one uses military and defense forces as part of the first response. What we can bring is an understanding of cultural context, an understanding of how to engage with the with the populations above and beyond. Um, satellite mapping and, and other data that's actually important to know where to intervene, et cetera, et cetera. But from a, from a cultural and engagement perspective, what we can bring to that in terms of synergy is the deep contextual knowledge of the environmental, societal, political environment that, uh, that the forces are engaging with. And by the other token, um, we uh, often don't turn towards uh, forces of security and defense when we're thinking ourselves about new partners that we can work with to advance sustainable development. Um, and we know today that some of the major objectives uh, that those forces have are directly linked to well-being of populations, um, to development, uh, to uh, helping, for example, build resilient habitats uh, in island nations, to, to training of young people. Uh, and there again, um, there are synergies with the work that we do. So I think that getting in on the ground floor with more of, um, I would call it a strategic dialogue, but strategically operational, if you like, okay? We're not there to, to talk about the, um, perhaps the, the things that Clio uh, was, was really focusing on, but we are there um, to use all of the intelligence that we can bring together to ensure that whatever the domain of intervention, it is, it is adapted, it is tailored to the needs, and it is informed by the realities uh, of the islands and the cultures and the peoples um, that we're all working with. So that's just one suggestion. And again, it's not exhaustive. Um, it's, a, it's a huge subject, um, but I think there's real potential. Thank you, Cameron. That was uh, quite, quite clear. Uh, um, well, so, so Zarek is gone. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you, you Zarek, whether are you gone or are you still there? I can I can no longer see you. I hope you're not gone. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you whether you you saw any role for the private sector in all of this. Oops. Okay. Well, perhaps we can we can get back to Zarek later on. All right, well, there are a couple of questions from the audience, so let's uh, take those. Uh, there is a specific question to Cleo. So, uh, Cleo, what are the, I'm just reading out the, uh, the questions since the audience doesn't have the possibility to speak. Uh, what are the possibilities of the associated states of the uh, US in Micronesia with Guam requesting statehood in the US? And this, the question comes from David Cameron from Sciences Po. Uh, so, good question. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that it's, it's not hugely likely. Uh, you know, they finally got their independence and I think they, they value it uh, quite a bit. Um, the, question, the question may be whether um, offers of compacts of free association are offered to, to other countries. Um, so this is something that was mooted, uh, brought up 
just an exploratory fashion during the previous US administration um, about whether compacts could be offered to Nauru and Kiribati, um, which would make all five independent states of Micronesia have uh, be in a special sort of relationship with the US. That hasn't really moved forward. Um, I think that the, the primary concern, I mean, the relationship between the freely associated states and the US now, um, the person-to-person, economy-to-economy, all that stuff is quite deep. Uh, politically, uh, and unless the, the nuclear issue is solved with the Marshall Islands and the compacts are renewed in a timely fashion, this is, this is a problem. And there have been uh, multiple bi bipartisan letters sent from Congress to uh, President Biden, to uh, NSA Jack Sullivan, to I mean, the, the, across the board. Uh, Kurt Campbell saying we want this problem solved, and and the the problem is the problems thing, things are holding it up for things like the post office doesn't want to pay for delivery to uh, the freely associated states anymore. They're kind of these uh, seemingly small bureaucratic issues that are undermining much larger strategic interests. Um, and the the Indo Pacific strategy of the of the U.S. said we want this solved, uh, and. Congress has said, we want this solved, but it's not being solved. It's not solved until it's solved, and that hasn't happened yet, and the pieces don't seem to be in place for it to be solved quickly. So as long as that festers, um, you know, an even closer relationship is extremely, is extremely unlikely. Um, and extending it to other countries in the region who are, wa if everybody watches their neighbors, everybody watches how their neighbors are dealing with whatever country it might be, Australia, New Zealand, US, China, and that goes into their calculations of how they're going to be building uh, their relationships. Um, I'd, I'd also, I'd just like to, uh, to build on something Cameron brought up, which is, which is very important and which we're seeing more of, which is this uh, increasing uh, use of the military in the area around things like HADR. And we saw this in, in the Tonga situation. Um, that also brings a whole bunch of different strategic assessment to an engagement. So the Tonga, the, the Tonga, what happened to Tonga was awful. I mean, they had a they had a volcano, and then they had an ash storm, and then they had an earthquake, and then they had a tsunami. It was just a whole horrible. And so the uh, international response was very welcome. The nature of that response, somebody in my position who um, isn't part of a multilateral organization and definitely isn't a diplomat, was very helpful for seeing uh, who's trying to do what in the region. Um, and one thing that was noticed was the Australians, for example, um, and I have this from, from the US side as well, basically said to the US, don't send, don't send any, but don't send in one of your Marine Amphib units, we've got it covered, and they sent the Adelaide, the HMAS Adelaide. The Adelaide unfortunately broke down while in port and the um, sailors had COVID. And even though there was a, a kind of non-contact delivery, COVID was trans, the population got COVID, Tonga got COVID. And whether it's accurate or not, because a lot of other people were involved on the street, they now think that what they're saying is they got the COVID from the Australians. But mercifully, it was Omicron and nobody has died. But you have a situation where um, allies who want to be seen to be taking a leadership role for their own strategic positioning regions reasons kind of say to everybody else, I've got this covered, don't worry, you can trust me in the Pacific. And the ship breaks down and they have a political warfare failure uh, uh, within the country. So I would uh, just to just to reinforce what Cameron is saying, you know, increasingly, you know, work together as much as we can, coordinate as much as we can. Uh, you don't have to do this alone and make sure that what you're actually delivering is what the people of the region need. Thank you. Thank you, Cleo. Uh, now I will give the floor to Christian de Chervy, who apparently has a question. So, Christian, that you should be able to speak. Oui, bonjour à. Parfait. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Um, une question reprenant les propos du président euh, micronésien. Évidemment, on attend du président micronésien qu'il euh, demande à qu'on prête attention à son pays. Or, ce que je constate, certes, le Pacifique insulaire est l'angle mort de la politique indo-pacifique, mais au sein de la politique du Pacifique insulaire, 
je dirais, la Micronésie, l'espace micronésien, c'est l'angle mort euh, du Pacifique. Or, on voit bien que l'on a besoin d'une politique micronésienne. La crise du Forum des îles du Pacifique le démontre. Cela offre des possibilités d'interaction avec les Américains. Cela offre des possibilités d'interaction en particulier avec les pays d'Asie du Nord-Est qui ont développé pas seulement des liaisons aériennes, mais aussi des coopérations. Je pense au Japon, je pense à la Corée, je pense à Taïwan. Or, euh, les Européens et les Français, nous regardons la Micronésie, je dirais, depuis l'extérieur, diplomatiquement, depuis notre ambassade aux, aux Philippines et beaucoup de nos partenaires, euh, je regarde, je dirais, de l'Ouest. Alors, dans ce contexte, comment peut-on construire euh, une politique française et, mi et européenne euh, micronésienne et comment l'articuler avec les stratégies régionales de nos territoires d'outre-mer, la Nouvelle-Calédonie et la Polynésie française, la Nouvelle-Calédonie évidemment ayant des relations historiques structurées, parfois turbulentes, avec l'ère mélanésienne, et la Polynésie, Wallis et Futuna, ayant évidemment une relation privilégiée avec les pays du triangle polynésien. Merci. Merci. So, who wants to respond to Christian Gervais, who, who used to be our ambassador in the region? I mean, that's, that's why he's so knowledgeable about the region. Mais en fait, je dirais que c'est lui qui connaît le quoi faire mieux que mieux que nous, puisqu'il connaît la région tellement bien. And and you know, I would just go back to this issue, as he mentioned. You know, it's being covered by the Philippines. Um, so, you know, if, if you're serious about it, you have to be there. I mean, this is, this is what came up. Uh, we, we did actually with IFRI, when I, at, with Chatham House, when I was at Chatham House and IFRI, we did this Indo-Pacific project and we, we, part of what we did was do a strategic round table in the Kingdom of Tonga. And um, they have, a, France has a, an honorary consul in Tonga, which is very helpful, but uh, there are eight French citizens in Tonga and, uh, and people, people aren't learning French. Uh, so, you know, it, it's the language issues can, can also be an issue, which is why, um, you know, for example, Quebec has a very good relationship with, with New Caledonia and, and French Polynesia and Wallace and Futuna because those students can come and study in Quebec. So that gives leverage to Canada on that front. But France, um, you know, any, any sort of people to people outreach or building of those relationships is preliminary for uh, building out into other sectors like economic and strategic, if you want to go at the ground level. Otherwise, I think France is specifically is very well known for being uh, an important Indo-Pacific strategic player, which means that, you know, you can talk directly to Washington and Canberra and Wellington and Tokyo and, and that, but that's, that's different than a relationship with the countries them, themselves. Cameron? Merci Françoise euh, et euh, bonjour euh, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, ça fait plaisir de vous revoir dans l'éther numérique à, à nouveau. Euh, C'est une vraie question, euh, mais je dirais que pour ce qui concerne en tout cas la communauté du Pacifique, euh, la Micronésie n'est certainement pas un angle mort. Nous avons depuis 2008 un bureau sous-régional implanté euh, pour, décir, pour servir et, euh, nos, nos membres dans le Pacifique Nord, en tout cas dans le nord du Pacifique insulaire. Euh, à, à Pompey, aux États fédérés de Micronésie. Euh, nous avons un engagement très régulier également avec le sommet euh, des présidents micronésiens. Et euh, je pense que euh, pour développer ce, cette politique dont vous parlez, que ce soit au niveau de, de l'Union européenne, euh, dont la délégation euh, est à Suva, euh, ou la France, ou ses, ses collectivités, et encore une fois, je ne souhaite pas sortir de mon rôle, mais je, je fais des suggestions en, en tant qu'observateur de la région. L'une des solutions, ce serait de mieux investir en fait les organisations régionales, les utiliser comme des plateformes de mutualisation de contact, les utiliser comme des biais par lesquels on peut coopérer. Quand on n'a pas nécessairement les moyens de coopérer sur le plan bilatéral avec tout le monde, on peut toucher ces pays-là à travers... Euh, les organismes euh, dont euh, l'ensemble des pays du Pacifique, mais parce qu'on parle de la Micronésie en espèce dont les pays micronésiens euh, sont membres. On peut se mettre autour de la table pour débattre des grands enjeux régionaux euh, avec ces mêmes pays. On peut avoir dans les coulisses euh, les bilatérales 
les collectivités euh, Nouvelle-Calédonie et Polynésie française en particulier ont, ont encore une possibilité supplémentaire à travers euh, leur statut de membre euh, du Forum des îles du Pacifique. Et donc, cette possibilité de participer pleinement euh, au débat euh, de la communauté océanienne euh, et euh, aux décisions sur les priorités et, et sur les actions. Mais il faut mettre, en fait, des moyens et de la capacité derrière une politique réellement construite, pas juste parler d'insertion régionale, mais, de, mais, mais développer en fait une politique d'insertion régionale bâtie sur le plan culturel, sur le plan économique, sur le plan politique, et puis investir les espaces euh, existants euh, pour développer les contacts humains, les contacts avec les dirigeants, les contacts avec les décideurs dans les administrations, les contacts avec euh, les hommes et les femmes d'affaires euh, qui comptent dans la région euh, pour justement, euh, sans nécessairement avoir besoin d'ouvrir une mission euh, de suite, en fait, être là à travers ces plateformes de mutualisation qui existent et qui sont, à mon sens, sous-investies au jour d'aujourd'hui euh, et donc sous-utilisées euh, pour développer ce type de politique et pour créer du lien. Merci. Well, thank you, Cameron. I think it's a very interesting suggestion. Don't add to, to the existing institutions. <laughs> well, Zarek, you raise your hand, please. Thank you very much, uh, Francois, and uh, thank you very much to the ambassador for that uh, question. I think just as, as Cameron had, has mentioned, I think the, the critical thing uh, for a development partner like the, like the European Union or, or, or France or any other EU member state is to get involved, uh, to try and support the country in addressing its most immediate uh, needs and its most immediate challenges. And I think for Micronesia, obviously shipping and connectivity uh, are a major challenge uh, for that particular uh, subregion. Uh, there's only one airline uh, that serves uh, the Micronesian uh, uh, region, which is United Airlines uh, from the United States. And it's very expensive uh, to travel uh, to the Micronesian region. Uh, you know, the costs of things that we take for granted is also very expensive. Uh, I must uh, you know, commend uh, the EU in terms of some of the things that it has done. For example, uh, providing visa free or visa waivers uh, to the Micronesian states and a number of other Pacific states. So it's easier uh, for Pacific nationals to travel into uh, the Schengen areas or, or the areas of the European Union. But apart from that, uh, the European Union has also provided funding uh, to the Pacific Islands Forum, and we are posting a trade advisor uh, to the Micronesian subregion to help develop the trade capacity of the Micronesian states to tra trade amongst each other, but also uh, with the European Union and other regions in the world. And these are the practical types of assistance and support uh, that will be much valued and appreciated by the Micronesian states. And I think it will go a long way in terms of bridging that gap or bridging the divide that remains there and, and ensuring that Europe is much closer uh, to the Pacific, in, in, including Micronesia in particular. Thank you, Francois. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Cleo, I see that your uh, hand is raised again. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, just a just a quick note, just a practical note. So um, in, in many of the Pacific Island countries, their uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is quite small. So in Tonga, there's about half a dozen, or well, all, around 10 people doing all of their foreign policy interactions. Um, so they're, you know, they're they're quite over overwhelmed. They have to do everything from, you know, COP to UNSC to whatever. Uh, so that's just something to bear in mind. Um, and the other is that there there are other locations uh, that that where that where there are a lot of Pacific Island expert leaders. Where you can find, which is you know specifically New York because of the UN, and also in Brussels. And if somebody gets an appointment to be an ambassador from a Pacific island to New York or or to the EU, then they are very well connected and very linked into their decision making process. So um, yes, go to the region, but also there are people outside of the region who know these topics extremely well and who can. Uh, uh, you know, if, if trust is gained, can give you a very deep understanding of what's going on in the region and in terms of potential for engagement with them. And in many cases, they work semi-autonomously because of how uh, overwhelmed the foreign affairs uh, departments are back home. Uh, also, I'd also just to add, uh, Japan is extremely good on the Pacific Islands. They have a lot of representation. They're opening more. Um, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force uh, it travels throughout the region increasingly. They were recently in Palau and New Caledonia. 
Um, and so I would not uh, underestimate them in terms of their interest in the region, their, their widely respected engagement in the region and their understanding of the region. Cameron, you want to add something about the EU being an observer? <laughs> Ah oui, euh, merci euh, Françoise. Oui, euh, pour vous donner un exemple euh, très concret de ce dont je parlais euh, juste avant, euh, avant Cléo, euh, depuis l'an dernier, l'Union européenne a acquis le statut d'observateur permanent auprès de la communauté du Pacifique. Alors, c'est un statut institutionnel, mais dans le concret, ça veut dire que le représentant de l'Union européenne est autour de la table lors de nos grandes réunions de gouvernance. Les représentants de l'Union européenne sont systématiquement invités aux ateliers, aux travaux menés par la CPS, aux côtés de nos États et territoires membres. Et donc, cela donne, à travers cette espèce de communauté régionale de développement qu'est la CPS, la possibilité pour l'Union européenne d'avoir un engagement de proximité, des contacts de proximité avec euh, les pays de la zone que l'on n'a pas nécessairement quand on est quelquefois un peu euh, à l'extérieur à travers des, des dialogues euh, tiers que l'on organise de manière un peu ad hoc euh, ou euh, des, des négociations euh, sur des accords de partenariat euh, économique ou des accords de développement, etc. Ce n'est pas pour dire que tout cela n'a pas de valeur, mais c'est pour mmh. montrer à quel point nous avons travaillé avec l'Union européenne pour essayer de rendre réel ce dont je parlais, c'est-à-dire utiliser les plateformes qui existent pour améliorer, approfondir en fait la connaissance l'un de l'autre et faire venir l'Europe dans le Pacifique et faire venir le Pacifique au plus près de l'Europe. Thank you, Cameron. That that was extremely clear, and I think that uh, it, it, indeed what is important is get more proximity, despite the distance. <laughs> So, so, so to speak, and so uh, using the existing institutions is indeed a very positive thing to uh, to do. And uh, this uh, status of observer is certainly a big step forward, uh, indeed. Well, I'm afraid we are running out of time, and so we have to uh, uh, stop this this panel. Uh, so we will break for uh, what whatever coffee coffee break, or uh, I don't know exactly what. Since it's pretty late at night in the in the in the Pacific, and we'll resume in uh, 15 uh, minutes with uh, with um, Céline Pajon, who will be chairing the second uh, panel. So I do thank all our speakers for uh, their intervention, for their uh, reactions, responses. That was very lo lovely discussion, and I think a very useful discussion. Because you have, yeah, yeah, you have to be aware of the the lack of knowledge in this part of the world about the uh, the Pacific region. So the, really, the the point for us is to do our best so that there is a better knowledge. And I definitely think that uh, this exchange has contributed to this improvement of the of the knowledge or deepening of the knowledge. But it's just one step. So there will be further ones. So thank you again, and uh, we'll resume in 15 minutes. <laughs>